welcome to the Geography Education Research Collective Summer Webinar. Um, Jericho is a small group of researchers whose work contributes to the field of geography education. And today we are delighted uh, to be joined by three presenters. So Professor Noel Castry, uh, Dr. Cyrus uh, Nairi and Hina Robinson to discuss the Anthropocene and how we can engage with it in school geography. Uh, Noel Castry is Professor of Society and Environment at the University of Technology, Sydney and Professor of Geography at Manchester University. Uh, and if you're not aware of uh, the time differences, it's just gone 4.30 uh, in Australia. So my heartfelt thanks uh, go to Noel for being willing to get up so early for us. Um, so Snowy is Head of Geography at Dulwich College and Acting Course Director for the Geography PGC Programme at uh, King's College London. And Hina Robinson is a Geography Teacher and Diversity Lead at Southend High School for Girls. Uh, and is also a member of the Geographical Association's governing body and joint chair of its diversity and inclusion working group. Uh, she also taught at King John's School, which was my old secondary school in Essex. Um, so Noel will start this webinar with a presentation summarising the scientific origins and the evolution of the concept of the Anthropocene, and then identify key themes and implications for geographers. And uh, then Cyrus and Hina will respond by considering how engagement with environmental issues uh, can emerge in the school classroom and suggest some practical tips or steps that teachers can take, uh, including ways to use art and student voice. After the presentations, we will open the discussion to the floor and we welcome questions to our three presenters at that point. Um, so no further ado, over to you now. Uh, thanks, Emma. Hi, everyone. Um, really great to have this opportunity to speak to you all. Yeah, so as Emma said, I'm going to introduce you to the, the geoscientific concept of the Anthropocene. Um, it's intrinsically and quite profoundly geographical as an idea. Um, I'm going to summarise its scientific origins and content, and then I'll say a little bit about, a bit about its implications, which are quite epic, um, and talk briefly, if I've got time, about how to make it teachable. Uh, before handing over to Cirrus and, and Hina. So there are three parts to the presentation. Yeah, great. Okay, so three parts to talk. Um, so before I turn to the, the science, just a few general comments about the Anthropocene idea. Um, so the term's now in its third decade, but it's not yet become part of the, the lingua franca um, in the way that terms like climate change or globalization or artificial intelligence clearly have. Uh, but it deserves to. Since 2000, um, the word has graduated from an academic buzzword to today an academic keyword that's subject to analysis across a plethora of disciplines. So these range from uh, zoology to philosophy to anthropology and, belong, and beyond. Sorry. And since I first began studying it about 10 years ago, uh, published academic literature has ballooned. So if you type Anthropocene into Google Scholar, you now get over 300,000 um, results, which is pretty overwhelming. Um, so it's becoming really hard to keep up with the literature, even for someone like me, who ostensibly has the time to study it quite systematically. Um, and it means that you have to have some literacy in geoscience, in ethics, in business studies, in economic history, and lots more besides. Um, the current Wikipedia entry on the Anthropocene is quite good. Uh, but actually you already need to know a lot to really understand it properly. So I guess the take home message is that for busy teachers like yourselves, let alone the average uh, teenage geography student, it's really easy to end up with a, model, a muddled or incomplete uh, understanding of the Anthropocene, supposing that you're interested in it at all. And let's be honest, uh, there are lots of other things to command our daily attention. Um, but I would obviously suggest um, that the Anthropocene really is worth knowing about, uh, especially among the un younger generation, uh, many of whom have engaged in the school strikes um, since the summer of 2018. So uh, enough of the preamble. Um, let's go to the third slide. So um, the Anthropocene is first and foremost, it's a geoscience concept and it translates roughly uh, as the age of humans. Uh, it's a much larger concept than anthropogenic climate change, although it does share the focus on the collective human impact on the natural world. Um, and the Anthropocene refers to the fact that our activities are significantly changing, not just the atmosphere, but also the cryosphere, the biosphere, the hydrosphere, and the pedosphere. So it means that, albeit unintentionally, uh, modern humans are altering the vast uh, metaphorical stage 
upon which our lives have been lived out since um, the Holocene epoch began around 11,700 years ago at the end of the last glacial period. So obviously then this is a remarkable insight. Um, we're quite accustomed to acknowledging that humans can deforest a region or over harvest a fish stock or divert a major river like the Yangtze. Um, but the Anthropocene describes planetary scale changes that have inadvertently set in motion, uh, that humans have set in motion, and ones that include but extend beyond anthropogenic climate change. As I'm sure many of you know, uh, the term was officially coined back in 2000 by the Nobel Prize winning scientist Paul Crutzen, who recently died, and an American freshwater biologist called Eugene Sturmer. Um, for several years, it was little known in academia. It was really used uh, among a group of so-called Earth system scientists like Crutzen and an Australian climatologist who's become quite influential in the field called Will Steffen. Um, but since 2008, uh, there's been a major drive in the geoscience community to adduce and assess evidence for the end of the Holocene. So it's really taken off as a scientific focus. Um, and obviously the Holocene is the period in which Homo sapiens have multiplied and in many parts of the world uh, have um, flourished. And there are two, rules, uh, two branches of science that have been involved. So I'm just gonna um, say a little bit about them. We have to move that out because um, that was uh, is covering part of the slide. Um, I can't use my slideshow. So we've got two branches of science. So firstly, there are earth system scientists who are working in large multinational teams. Um, this really started with what was called the International Geosphere Biosphere Programme, which ran for 25 years and ended in 2015. And the scientists, and you can see there just the picture of Paul Crutzen, who's one of them. Um, what they've done is, is synthesized a massive evidence, much of it remotely sensed about greenhouse gas concentrations, about atmospheric temperatures, about ocean acidification, about nutrient cycle changes, about species extinctions, um, and hydrological cycle changes and much more besides. And what they have proposed is that the magnitude, the scale and the scope of the human impact on the earth is sufficient to call our period the Anthropocene. So for, for example, as I'm sure you know, um, current greenhouse gas concentrations are about 33% higher than the natural maximum reached during the long glacial interglacial switching period of the last tens of thousands of years. And the rate of increase uh, of greenhouse gas uh, gases uh, concentration, sorry, also seems unprecedented relative to past natural rates of greenhouse gas variation uh, that we know of anyway. Uh, likewise, uh, the size and rate of species loss caused by humans exceeds the natural background rate of the last 12,000 years or so uh, by around 1,000, according to many uh, zoologists. And that's where you get the term, the sixth great extinction that humans are causing. So the critical point that Earth system scientists are making is that this impact of humans on the planet has accelerated vastly in just 75 years, which is the lifetime of my mum. So a single person's lifetime in the wealthy world anyway. Um, and that impact is escalating uh, as the years uh, go by. Uh, now, somewhat independently of this Earth system science research, uh, a bunch of stratigraphers have also been considering the evidence for the end of the Holocene. And uh, if I was able to show you my slideshow properly, you'd see a couple of other photographs uh, on the screen there. And one of them is of a British stratigrapher called Jan Salasevich at the University of Leicester, who's been a really key person in the stratigraphic work about the uh, Anthropocene. And he was head of a thing called the Anthropocene Working Group, um, which for the last, uh, I think 13 years now, has toiled tirelessly to see if the Anthropocene can be formally classified as a new epoch in the Earth's 4.5 billion year history. Now, this work requires real rigor because geologists are very particular about the geological time scale. And so I'm going to just switch that back onto the screen properly now. Um, so this is a version of the geological time scale on the screen. Um, it's quite a simplified one. Um, and obviously it records notable shifts in the operation of the Earth system. Uh, and in the past, those changes have had natural causes, for example, uh, and famously, the eight mile wide uh, Chicxulub asteroid that 
hit the earth about 65 million years ago and wiped out most of the dinosaurs would be an example of those sort of natural transitions in the earth system. Um, so what stratigraphers do, as I'm sure you know, is they look for shifts um, in the earth's environment that end up being visible in rock layers that contain uh, mineralogical, biological or other evidence of major alterations to uh, the life conditions uh, on the planet. So the question for stratigraphers about the Anthropocene is this, uh, in future, will there be a discernible stratigraphic record of the game changing effects of human activity? Um, perhaps they're already visible, but would they be visible definitively in say 15 or 20,000 years if a, you know, an alien species was to come and visit the earth and figure out what the heck had gone on? Um, and the Anthropocene uh, Working Group believes the answer is yes. And they've almost completed a formal case that will be sub, uh, submitted to the, the keeper of the geological timescale, um, which is called the International Commission on Stratigraphy. And that case will be submitted by the end of this year, all being well. So the group has been looking at things like the prevalence of plastics, of chicken bones, of um, the fact that we've got a lot of cows on the planet and we've lost a lot of wild species, the prevalence of concrete. And they're asking, um, will these things leave an enduring trace that an imaginary stratigrapher would spot thousands of years into the future? Um, and at the moment, um, the group believes that the human impact is best represented uh, by radionuclides from atomic bombs that were detonated in the 1945 to 63 period as really the best marker for the start of the Anthropocene. So there's a lot more I could say about the Anthropocene uh, geoscience. I obviously don't have the time. So let me just make a few very quick observations and I'll switch to the implications for geography. Um, so firstly, uh, the Anthropocene isn't yet a formal term in geology. As I said, the case is being made and will be submitted, but it's nonetheless become an, an established term in large parts of geoscience. So it's here to stay in academia and it could well enter into public discourse in the next decade or two and become a fixture of our language, but that remains to be seen. Second, um, the big geoscience questions about the Anthropocene, there are a few of them, are these, when did it begin? What's the best evidence to demonstrate significant human alteration of the Earth system? How much alteration is sufficient for the Anthropocene to be classified as a new epoch as opposed to a minor shift in the Earth system? Um, what sort of future conditions can we expect this century and out to the, the next millennium? And finally, how hard do we have to pump the metaphorical brake to avoid the worst consequences of the Anthropocene? So those are the major science questions. Um, and then thirdly, um, um, as you all know, the high regard that science is held in worldwide, despite the occasional image crisis, is what leads governments and businesses and ordinary people to sometimes respond positively to scientific pronouncements. Um, those pronouncements are deemed to be credible and uh, lead to action. Um, and in that context, I think the Anthropocene idea should be seen as a metaphorical alarm bell that is being sounded by the geoscience community. It's one that's bigger and far louder than the notion of anthropogenic climate change or even COVID-19. And Earth system scientists like Paul Crutzen and Will Steffen, and Will Steffen's just down the road from me in, uh, in Canberra at the Australian National University, they've been particularly forthright in noting that the evidence for the Anthropocene's onset does imply the need for massive changes in the ways in which we live across the globe. Um, now this, I guess, notion that the Anthropocene is potentially a, a bit of a crisis, um, has been captured quite graphically in a related idea called the idea of planetary boundaries. And it's depicted there on the left. Um, it's particularly associated with a Swedish um, academic called Johan Rockström uh, at the Stockholm Resilience Institute, but also Krutz and uh, Stefan and a few others are very associated with the idea. The notion is that there are nine boundaries uh, that we've exceeded uh, three of them already, which you see in red there. Um, and this idea is also linked to the notion of tipping points, which are depicted on the right side of the slide. Um, the idea is that we're perhaps leaving what's called a safe operating space for humanity and maybe entering a hot house earth, quote, um, that will be irreversible on human timescales. So these ideas, the Anthropocene, planetary boundaries, a hot house earth, and a few other uh, concepts, um, 
I clearly intended to capture the existential threat or the sheer profundity of what humans are doing to their one and only home. And they emphasize that there's no going back to Holocene conditions. The only question really, I think for them, is whether a more or less hospitable future awaits us, depending on the actions that we now take. Okay, so um, what I'll do now is I'll just turn um, for a few minutes to how the, the science of the Anthropocene is relevant to geographers, because it most certainly is, uh, just as it's relevant to most subjects that are taught in schools and universities worldwide. And I think uh, probably the way to think about this is, is to say that the Anthropocene is the ultimate concept of change. Um, it suggests that the entire physical geography of the globe is altering in the blink of an eye when compared to previous rates of Earth system change. And in turn, that implies that the world's human geography will have to change through a mixture of design and necessity. So the Anthropocene will, we might say, uh, become an epoch of liquid geographies where the human drama is played out on an increasingly unstable uh, stage. And as a science writer called Gaia Vince has phrased it, quote, the earth is now a human planet. But let me be a bit more specific and I'm just gonna make four uh, quick points. So firstly, um, in countries like the UK, uh, much local day-to-day -day activity now has non-trivial global environmental implications and vice versa. Now, climate change has made that obvious already, but the Anthropocene idea implies that seemingly innocuous place-based activities like, I don't know, you know, purchasing a plastic wrapped chicken Kiev breast from Tesco or something like that, um, are cum cumulatively altering the entire environment of other places, other people, and ultimately the globe. So the micro and the seemingly mundane now translates into the macro and the profound. So that's the first thing to say. Secondly, um, all ostensibly economic, social, cultural, and political action, according th to the Anthropocene idea, is now environmental action and at all geographical scales. So in other words, the distinction between people and nature has been seriously eroded all the way up and all the way down. And in a sense, the world is now unnatural or artificial, raising questions for us about the sort of physical environments that we could and should inhabit. And a philosopher called Christopher Preston, who's based in the United States, dubs ours a synthetic world in a recent book of that name. And I think that's in some senses not hyperbole. Um, thirdly, um, much present day action at any geographical scale um, is now having very long term and largely irreversible impacts on the earth. I think that's a third implication of the Anthropocene concept. So um, human history is now merging with the hitherto slowly changing deep history of the planet. And our actions will affect, and in fact are affecting, all future generations and almost all living species, as well as the inanimate parts of the world's geography. So that's the third thing. And I've called that temporal implosion on the slide there, as you can see. And then fourthly, um, and finally, understanding human impacts on the earth uh, near and far, today and tomorrow, is chock full of uncertainty because the earth system is, of course, extraordinarily complex. So that makes political and moral decisions, uh, decision-making about what to do. For example, the United Nations Paris Accord on greenhouse gas emissions makes it very, very tricky indeed to know what the right thing to do actually is. And I guess the safest policy, and this is an implication of the Anthropocene idea, is radical precaution today, not tomorrow. But of course that comes at a huge price and would cause mass citizen protests and massive resistance from sections of big business if it were to be implemented aggressively. So it, therefore it will not be implemented aggressively. So um, what do these four things imply for geographical research and teaching beyond the obvious need to understand the changing dynamics of the earth system uh, through really good geoscientific research? Well, I think the high level agenda looks a little bit like this. Um, and I've, I've now got five, five quick points to make rather than four. So the first one um, is about I guess what you would call global change of, chains of causality, impact and response. 
So as I intimated a, a minute ago, um, there is a chain of causality running from place-based place -based actions to wider environmental changes and then back to local scale impacts and consequent responses. Uh, responses that involve um, both the mitigation of and adaptation to geographical changes. So that directs attention um, to our, our attention to differentiated causality, differential impacts in different parts of the world and differential responses. The world is of course tightly connected, but it's not and will never be homogenous. And so place as geographers are want to say still matters very, very much indeed. So that's the first thing. Second, scalar contradictions and complementarities. So um, big questions arise about how decisions and events and initiatives occurring at small scales, for example, in Sydney, where I am right now, uh, how are they going to complement national and global ambitions for planetary safety? So keeping global warming at less than two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, for example, or imagine a plan to rewild one third of the Earth's surface. How is that going to play out in terms of um, what makes sense at the local scale may not make um, sense globally, maybe contradictions. How might they be resolved? Third, uh, multi-level governance, uh, cross-border management, uh, those sorts of issues. So questions arise about the incentives, the goals and the rules that will enable a world of over 190 countries and thousands of cities to move forward cooperatively to av avoid uh, a bad Anthropocene. So what are the barriers to such trans-border cooperation in a world where wealth and power are unequally distributed, as we know? Can our current institutions like the United Nations cope? What geopolitical rivalries and opportunities exist to both prohibit and enable a collective uh, human response to the threats of the Anthropocene? So those are really important questions. Fourth, um, geographies of geoengineering. Um, in all three cases just mentioned, it's really likely that various geoengineering technologies will be very relevant. So these are technologies that seek to keep the earth close to a Holocene state, for example, large scale carbon capture and underground storage, or mass planting of uh, quick growth trees, uh, plus deliberate re rewilding of landscapes. So lots and lots of different geoengineering technologies, some natural, some much more artificial. Um, so that there are clearly going to be huge costs, risks and benefits uh, associated with these and many of the technologies are untested at scale. Uh, there are questions about when, where and at what scale to deploy them. And those questions beg really complex answers, including uh, considerations about the morality and justice aspects of using particular technologies. And a big focus in the literature has been injecting particles into the stratosphere to reflect solar radiation back into out to space. So, you know, what are the implications of doing that? Should it be done internationally? What would happen if a, if a country like China did it on its own? Those sort of questions are, arise. And then finally, uh, in terms of implications for research and teaching, uh, geographies of uh, socio-environmental reform and transformation. So in all the four areas I've just mentioned, um, questions arise about the, the nature and rate of reform. So that's sort of incremental change to present practices versus a more radical transformation uh, of the system uh, in which we live our lives. Uh, so that's, I guess, what radicals call plan A, is you know, revolution, transforming the system, because there is no planet B. Um, and so there's some really interesting questions about the kind of values, the norms, the habits, the infrastructures and institutions that we need uh, to transition more or less quickly towards a more habitable uh, future. Uh, and obviously, we're not going to have a one size fits all solution. So in some places, you might get a Green New Deal. In other places, you might get decoupling from the global economy and degrowth. In other cases, you might have eco authoritarianism, authoritarianism, a strong state uh, sort of setting Earth system laws and expecting people to abide by them and so on and so forth. OK, um, so I'm just going to draw things to a close. Um, and I do have time, I think, just to say a few things about um, making the Anthropocene uh, teachable, if that's OK. So um, this is the third and final bit of the talk. So um, the Anthropocene is, is an incredibly important idea, but big questions arise about how to make it teachable 
both at a, a sort of analytical level, um, but also at the level of tackling, uh, I guess what you would call a super wicked problem in a practical way. Uh, and it's obvious to me, and I'm sure to you, that students could easily feel scared and disempowered uh, when you talk about the Anthropocene, if you were to talk about it in the classroom, or they might lapse into sheer denial about the seriousness of the issues because they seem like the stuff of science fiction rather than science fact. Um, and if you, know, if you think about it as well, humans have demonstrably um, had, have had the power and have the power to accidentally affect the whole Earth system, but we also like the power to control well, at least at the moment, changes to that system. And so that might be a very scary uh, thing to uh, recognize for students. So the challenge is to make the Anthropocene seem tangible and actionable uh, with climate change a key part of this. And ultimately the Anthropocene is personal. Uh, it's not just a matter of merely academic interest. It invites introspection and the exercise of agency uh, across the globe. So to that end, um, I'm just going to share some very simple ideas, and forgive me if these are naive, uh, about um, teaching this kind of stuff to students. Um, and bearing in mind that there are sort of three things that you can talk about. We've got the causes of the Anthropocene. We've got the impacts of the changes that we've set in motion to the planetary environment. And then we've also got questions around how do we respond in different places to the challenges that the Anthropocene poses. So um, here are a few very quick uh, ideas, and sorry, um, you can't see the first uh, line there. Um, so I'll just spell it out for you. So a kind of obvious thing to do is to get students to deconstruct what you might call the quintessential Anthropocene objects. Um, and they, for me, are what are called composite commodities like cars. So if you look at a, a car across its entire life cycle, the really good things to teach about um, students can think about the origins, the transportation and the impacts of metals, plastics, rubber, gasoline and more besides, raising questions about precisely who, far-flung producers or consumers or both, or governments, are responsible for the Holocene coming to an end. And so in effect, these commodities total ecological footprint sort of encapsulates what the Anthropocene is all about. Um, Secondly, in terms of responding to the Anthropocene, uh, unprecedented cooperation among nations will be required, as I noted before. We obviously live in a world that's deeply fractured um, in three respects. We've got economic competition and inequality. We've got political partition of the globe. And we're seeing this with Russia and to a lesser extent China at the moment, geopolitical conflicts. And then we've also got cultural pluralism and conflicts around cultural differences as well. Now on the plus side, uh, many of our students are from transnational families. Um, we, lived at, we live in a more mixed up world than, than in the past. And many students have got personal ties to other places and other people. So they, they're the sort of felt and effective ties. So that does offer a platform to invite them to ponder on what basis they might take the fate of other people and other places very seriously as part of their own concern as British citizens and how they might want the same in return from other parts of the globe. Um, thirdly, um, also in terms of a response to the Anthropocene, um, place matters hugely. I mentioned that in passing before. Um, none of us can change the globe alone, but together we can certainly transform the quality of the places we live in through cooperative citizen action, through uh, pressure uh, on local governments and local government elections and so on. Now, students might feel that this is trivial in the face of global change. But in fact, the opposite is true, particularly in wealthy countries, because as I said before, many of our daily actions are cumulatively significant in global terms. So I think students can be invited to think very concretely about local changes that might reduce uh, resource use, uh, allow nature more space to breathe in a particular town, allow people to connect to trees, water, grasses and so on. Um, a small example in Sydney here, um, citizen scientists have been placing what are called frog hotels all over the city. These are things like cups and little containers that will allow different species of, of frog to reclaim habitat that's been lost uh, through development. Um, another example um, is a place some of you will have heard of called Aubreville 
in um, Southeast India, uh, was established in 1968. Um, the, the people who live in Aubreville live in a very different way to the way in which we live in, in Western countries. Uh, it's essentially a communal settlement. Uh, there are no, there's no forms of ownership, certainly of property. Uh, resources are shared. Um, it's about mutual support. It's about looking after the natural environment. So local experiment, uh, quite a long running one that really lets students understand there is more than one way to live and that change is possible. Um, so this is really that old mantra, think globally, act locally. Um, and it relates to the Brundtland Report mantra that the earth is one, but the world certainly is not. Uh, the world is differentiated and uh, that's, you know, in many ways, a very good thing. And then finally, um, I think students can be invited to think about the future um, through exercises of imaginative geography. Now, the Anthropocene proposition says that we're making the future right now, today, next week and next month in important ways. So that raises important questions about the sort of future that our young people want, uh, if not for themselves and for their own children. And here I do think we need to give the imagination uh, some space as a technique for structuring our actions today um, by really thinking properly about tomorrow. Now in science, as I'm sure you know, uh, thinking about the future tends to take two forms. One is prediction or forecasting, and the other is scenario building, which is really about what could happen, even though it might not necessarily happen. I think um, being imaginative is a little bit different. It's, it's really about um, thinking what, what's desirable, what do we want, and then sort of tethering that to, uh, by thinking about what's possible. So it's between sort of realism and, and utopianism, idealism, something in the middle. So short stories and drawings um, are really good devices. And I'm sure you know and have used yourselves to get students to think imaginatively. I think you can use them in very concrete ways to get students to think about the places they live and you know, project out 100 years or 50 years, which for them is an awful long time, even though it might not be for us as adults. Um, quite a bit of what you might call Anthropocene fiction exists. Um, things like Cormac McCarthy's book, The Road, or the Netflix movie, Don't Look Up, which some of you will have seen. Um, and it's often quite dystopian. And I think it's important for students not to get bogged down in that sort of negative view of what the future could look like. Um, so yeah, I think acts of um, imaginative um, sort of scenario building can be really quite fruitful for students. So well, in there, uh, I've done three things, obviously, talked about the geoscience, talked about the broad implications for uh, geography and geographers, and then said a little bit at the end about making the issue teachable. Um, and I know the slides will be available uh, after this event, but there are some for, uh, learning resources. They're all publicly available, or they should be. And some of them are things to read, and some of them are things to watch. So thanks, uh, thanks Emma. And I'm going to hand over now, I guess, to uh, Cyrus. Um, well, um, hi, everybody. My name is Cyrus Nairi. Um, as Emma introduced me, I have a kind of foot in two camps. So I'm a geography teacher and, and a head of department, but I'm also um, as a sort of teacher trainer with one foot in university, also kind of interested in some of the kind of more academic debates around the Anthropocene and how they might touch down in what we do every day in the classroom. And I guess Noel's introduction was a lovely segue into what I want to say in that for me and, and, and my interests, the Anthropocene is, is, is a concept. It's, it's this idea of human nature entanglement, but it's also, it's also a provocation in and of itself. What does our teaching need to look like if we are teaching in the Anthropocene? And that's what I'm interested in. It's not how do we teach the Anthropocene per se, it's how does the Anthropocene change how we teach? And that's the pedagogy aspects that I really want to sort of talk about today. Um, so I'll talk for around 10 minutes around how the Anthropocene might, might provoke us to think about how we teach as geographers. And those of you who are interested, um, I wrote an article in Teaching Geography earlier this year with some, some more ideas. But all of these are provocations. They're not answers or solutions. They're just ideas. And those of you who are interested in, in some of these ideas, I would really invite you to get in touch with me to explore them further, because I'm really excited about the potential of what this looks like in the classroom. And I think we're at the very beginning of a journey. So one of the things I would like to kind of focus on here is 
how might, might we use the provocation of the Anthropocene, the idea that yes, we are teaching in as Noel you know, beautifully articulated, this unstable stage of the earth. The earth is not some kind of, you know, just flat, deadened surface. It's it's agential, it has an effect on us. It's moving, it's changing, these liquid geographies, geographies. Um, so how might we use the provocation of the Anthropocene to create new forms of environmental action in school? So what might we do and how might we teach in order to generate a kind of agential capacity? How might we generate more agency on, in our students to do something around the environment? And I found this huge question, you know, just started to chip away at it in a tiny, tiny way, the kind of focus of what I just want to spotlight a few kind of um, empirical or real examples for many of the, the teachers watching. Just as a way of sort of setting the scene of that bit more, um, just to sort of tie it back to some things which I think um, might be interesting here. So there's been lots of engagement with art and the idea of the Anthropocene in geographical literature and how art might facilitate thoughts and actions around environmental change. Um, and that's been really powerful for the way I think. Because as geographers, this idea of us being an interdisciplinary subject, I think one is one which lends us to thinking about art and materials as important devices for provoking thought. And that's one thing I'd like to think about. How does what we do in the classroom, what we use, shape the outcomes and the thoughts and the effects and the emotions in our students? The second point there, um, resituating the places, spaces and actions that constitute environmental action to the local and intimate spaces of the home for Mars. But that third point there is, can we think of the school as a relatively neglected space in geographical scholarship, I would suggest, as the locus from which legitimate environmental action is undertaken by children and young people? And what I mean by that is, I think we have long neglected the school as geographers and potentially even um, you know, those of us who work in schools as actually, you know, it's not just the protest, the student protest, what else is going on in schools, which could be classified as participating in making a change. I think that's profound. You know, what more does participation in 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 in, in environment in, in in making changes look like? So, um, just some thoughts there that lead us to what I'd like to talk about. So, just to kind of bring some of these big ideas into a few concrete examples, um, I'd like to talk about um, four different examples, really, from an Eco Week which took place. Um, it says November 2022 and um, in 2021, so last November, um, in my school. Um, but these are by no means kind of, um, you know, these are just, again, provocations for different ways I think teaching in the Anthropocene might look like. And each different kind of example involves a different kind of emotional or effective register. Noel spoke, and so um, did Emma around this idea of anxiety or hope was mentioned. And I think each of these different examples has a different kind of emotional or effective register through which it operates. And I know some of you in the audience are thinking about that too. And for me, it's how do you bring this idea of entanglement to the idea of teaching so that, it, that making, making change is not some abstract problem so that it becomes you know, anxiety inducing. We're talking a lot about eco-anxiety in school to something which is actually you know, doable. And first of all, I'd like just to touch on this lovely example. And, and this isn't actually from geography, although it's geographical in its nature. And um, one thing that I've seen done in our art department is this idea of making corals uh, out of clay. And mm -hmm. through the act of making pro, you know, thoughts and dialogue around coral bleaching and environmental consequences of coral are then provoked in the classroom. So it's thinking around the materials specifically that we use as a way of generating a particular kind of conversation. And I think that's profound. For a long time, geographers, of course, have used materials in the classrooms, in our classrooms, you know, be that sort of chocolate bars to demonstrate something or, or, or you know, whatever. Um, but this is, how do we turn attention to the very specific material properties of what we're using in order to, to provoke a thought and geographers 
professional sort of academic geographers have done this with, with knitting and other kinds of materials. Um, and I love this idea. And I think that we're at the beginning of thinking around this. A second example, and this is a performance, I think with year seven or eight, where plastic and litter is used as a kind of tool to generate a kind of um, uh, performance around the problem of plastics. Um, and there's a sort of messiness to this where the children are using, performing with the materials of the plastic. And as you can see on the, on the sort of PowerPoint, it's like this idea of drowning or disorientation, potentially, as a way of thinking through environmental problems. So it doesn't always have to be clear. Um, and the idea of performing itself in space I think is, is, is really interesting and using the materiality or the material of, of plastic in all of its sort of floaty um, and, and hard and, you know, sort of properties in order to think around the impact of, of plastics and geographers have, have of course highlighted those particular uh, materialities too. Thinking in the uh, Braun and Whatmore 2010 lovely uh, compilation as a, as a nice um, chapter in there around that. Some work that I've done just in, just in, in my teaching, getting um, geography students, particularly in, in sort of year, year seven, eight, nine, 11, 12 and 13, to think around visualizing some of these more abstract aspects of carbon um, by passing a paperweight around. Again, it's that materiality. What does it feel like? And then as a consequence, how do children feel? Is it shock and surprise? In this case, that's what I wanted to generate. Wow, okay. The carbon that's been used to make my, tech, my my mobile phone feels like this and it's quite shocking and therefore I might change. It doesn't have to be shock and there's an image down there around visualizing carbon and the amount of carbon by comparing it to the size of cities which is um, this carbon visuals website. So we as teachers might engineer this sense of shock and surprise. Another lovely example which um, is around you know this idea of the Anthropocene and knowledge. Who has you know, it's not only teachers that have exclusive right to knowledge in the Anthropocene, it might well be how do we use children's lived experiences. And this is a, an example which I implemented where I got students to think about their experiences of school and how we could design an eco school and feed that back into a conversation with architects who were designing the school. So it's this idea of sharing students' knowledge in almost like a competency group style, where when do we really value our students' knowledge um, and bring it to a level where it can be shared with and make a real change. Again, huge ideas and huge projects. And those of you who are interested in doing more of this with me or with others, please do get in touch. A slight, just um, a kind of um, uh, side note is um, linking to what Noel was saying around the everyday. You know, these are very small potentially in scale, but large, have large impacts. And how do we think around that in school? Well, this was just a photograph of, of one of those kind of things which we, we, we you know, have where small things can, uh, small things do great changes. And this idea of non-linearity or the local making bigger changes elsewhere is a way that we have started potentially to govern climate change in schools or govern environmental change. And what logics do we use? And that's just, again, another kind of really thoughtful, interesting way of studying what's going on in schools. So I'd just like to bring this to a close by thinking of lots of different dimensions and tying together a couple of strands. So O'Neill and Smith argue that many artistic visualizations verge on the incredible and may act to distance people from engaging with climate change. So how might we generate a sense of interconnection with nature to provoke a sense of agency rather than anxiety? So what do we do as teachers and educators that can, for, can generate a sense of action? And how do we pay attention to the emotions and effects we generate in the classroom through the materials that we use to in a way that um, creates change. And it's probably no single way, isn't it? Um, and I'd just like to end with these remaining questions. And I always like to generate more questions as a result of, of the work and the conversations. So what actually constitutes environmental action for children and young people? It's not just climate marches. So how do we broaden that understanding of what constitutes action in the Anthropocene? How can the school be better recognized as a site, as a place 
in which participation in environmental action takes place as a valid place? And what, uh, how might such actions be validated and encouraged? How can the scale of attention be shifted to the local and the immediate and the everyday? And there are some references and I will leave it there. Thank you so much for listening and I will hand over to Hina. Hello, Brian. So um, I'm, my name is Hina Robinson. I'm currently, I've been teaching for 23 years in secondary schools. Um, I'm active in geography currently. I've done that role in the past as well. Diversity lead um, in charge of rights respecting schools. And I'm also a chair of governors at a primary school. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the sort of primary influence on this as well. Um, I really want to sort of get you thinking about things to think about when we're teaching um, and also how to use student voice in what we're doing. Um, so, first of all, where are we actually teaching about the Anthropocene? How is it part of our curriculum map? So hopefully it is something that we are doing across all year groups, but I do know of um, schools and education centres where it is a standalone unit. It is just taught as climate change um, or maybe within something like deforestation um, and it's taught to the spec and it's sort of it's lip service. It's not partly it's not embedded in the curriculum and it's not part of everything that the students are learning about. And also is it cross curricular within schools? So when I was talking to my year 10 students today, um, just to gauge their sort of opinion um, of human impact, they said, well, oh, we learn about it in history as well when it comes to industrial revolution. And we learned about it in science um, through to biodiversity. And they can pick up other areas where um, they're learning about this too. And again, is that something that is clear within your school? Is that something that you can make links with? So we've got our obvious topics where we teach about the Anthropocene and um, our human impact on environment, obviously through climate change, um, through things like rainforests and deforestation and ecosystems in general. Um, if you're teaching oceans, you might be looking at impact of plastic on oceans. Um, but actually, can you embed it through everything else? That we teach. So I'm just going to give you some examples of, of how we do it and hopefully none of these are new to you. Um, so impact of urbanization for example, you know, can we think about the loss of natural environment that has occurred due to urbanization as well as things like impacts of air pollution, visual pollution, uh, land pollution etc as well. Um, impacts of coastal management are um, changing of the sediment cells so the idea that we're preventing erosion in one place, but actually increasing erosion elsewhere um, can be, you know, have a big impact, um, which is done for human benefit so that we have protection of human landscapes or provision of tourism. Um, and, you know, when we're teaching about coasts, are we actually linking that to climate change um, and things like sea level rise and the impact of that as well? And my students do a unit on globalization. And the focus of globalization for us is um, globalization conflict. So we're actually looking, first of all, at where products have come from and they investigate a product of their choice and where it's made and where the raw materials come from for that product and the impact of that extracting of raw materials, um, as well as sort of how people are working in factories and, um, and the whole supply chain process. But they also have a topic of globalization and conflict. This is our year eight students. So they've recently done presentations on water conflict. So they've talked about um, things like the Aral Sea, but they've also looked at the impact of the use of the River Nile. Um, they've looked at deforestation and conflict to do with wood um, and trees and forests. They've looked at conflict um, with air pollution, where they are looking at which countries are causing the pollution, which countries are suffering from it. Um, so they, they really have a look at human impact in terms of uh, global issues but the conflict that those global issues create things like coal tan and, and diamond mining etc as well so what i want you to sort of think about is beware being aware of that one size fits all do we actually know the students that we're teaching because that has an impact on how they see um, human impacts on environment and what they can do about it so for example where do they live? Do they live in a location where they can easily access resources, where they don't have to use um, cars or public transport? They can walk places. Do they live in conditions that make life difficult when it comes to deciding um, what to do in terms of impact? What do their parents do? I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, also, ethnic background. 
are they are they migrants are they first second third generation migrants because again the impact of what we're doing how we're teaching it what we're expecting them to do to change is because that's something we do teach about what impact does that actually have and there's a lot of sensitivity involved here with the way that we teach again with that one size fits all we've got to think about who is actually responsible for environment environmental change and um, being careful about using the word we um, and this comes up in different topic areas but if we're talking about we who are we referring to are we referring to collective society are we talking about us as adults are we talking about the students within our classroom because it's not going to be a generic term that applies to everybody you know who has actually caused that climate change so one of the big things that we've done in school this year is COP26 and we had student debates we had each tutor group representing a country so each year group had their own debate they've really researched the impact of climate change on the country that they were given and they've come to the table with a speech with arguments about what they should be doing and why they should be doing it who should be doing what and that impact and they really thought through well who's causing the changes who's who's having the impact of those changes and what should be done about it on a global scale and then they've got really disheartened because COP26 happened. They've come up with these ideas. They've heard about what was going on at the time. And then it's radio silence. Governments aren't doing, aren't doing anything. And those students are going, hang on a minute. What happened to COP26? What about all these things that were said by these different countries, these agreements that were supposedly made, and now nothing? And they feel that. And they feel, well, if governments aren't doing something, what about us? And it's really important that, again, we're not criticising life choices. Um, and I'll give you some examples of that. So, you know, one of the common things is um, people say, oh, don't fly. We shouldn't we shouldn't fly. Um, you know, Greta Thunberg has been travelling around the world without going on planes. And that's great. But if you're a second generation migrant, first generation migrant, even third, you've got family in other places. So you're then potentially making students feel guilty. So what? So I can't go and visit my nanny and grandma. Um, she can't come to see us because you're making me feel guilty about the fact that I fly. Um, this one really came up with me this year. Rice creates methane. Um, and we, you know, we use that as an example. And then one of my student, one of my year nine students who is going on to drop next year, she's half Japanese. And she said, but my parents cook rice almost every day. Should we not be eating rice anymore? But it's her Japanese culture. I'm not going to say to her, no, you absolutely should not be eating rice anymore. Um, you know, just like we wouldn't say, well, some people would say everyone should become vegan. But actually, you've got to think about that. Don't use cars, walk or use public transport instead. Again, great. And a lot of students do try and do that. But my mom's a taxi driver. That's how we survive. My dad's a delivery driver. Um, you know, their job involves them having to have their own car or van and travel around. If they didn't do that, they might not be able to get another job. Then what happens? And that's an issue. Eat only seasonal food. Again, great idea. Don't use, think about your food miles. You're, but again, ethnic background, if that applied to my family growing up, well, a lot of what we ate were vegetables that originated in other countries. And again, do we change our cultures? I think there's something, you know, you're bordering on potential racism if you're constantly telling people they have to change. So it's about that sensitivity and being really careful about who's in your classroom. We're not saying don't tell them to do anything, but it's really considering what it is they could be doing. So, you know, listening to your students, they want to have the influence. They want to be able to make their own decisions. What the initiatives they come up with is what is going to work. And um, Sarah's indicated about working within your own school, and I think that's really, really important. So the primary school that um, I'm chair of governance for, they have eco-warriors and those eco-warriors meet like the student governors do and they make decisions they think about what's going to work in our school to improve our environment within school and they do it so things like meat free mondays um which is obviously for the good of the planet as well but bring it use of single-use plastics within school they've considered you know having rules about water bottles and things like that as well um talking to their parents they've got um systems where they get rewarded for walking to school or scooting to school i know they don't always have influence on that but they do try you know mom dad can we leave the car at home we're going to leave 10 minutes early we're going to walk today and they are making those influences and 
you speak to the students within school. We had Ofsted in a few weeks ago and the Ofsted inspector did comment on the fact that students are involved in those decisions. They're the ones who are suggesting things that the school is then implementing. That's at primary level. And if students of those ages, and we're talking key stage one as well, can do that, then secondary age children definitely can. Same in my school. So um, bring and buy sales. So we're talking about reduce, reuse, recycle. We've got a comprehensive recycling scheme where at the moment it started with paper, but it's the students that are going around to collect the paper for recycling. They are speaking to staff who are using too much paper um, because left to the cleaners, that paper may not go in the recycling. They're then going to move on to plastic. So they're taking it step by step to see what works, implementing what works. They're taking the lead and it's working. They've asked for a bring and buy sale. So to raise money for charity, but also make things that they're not reusing, using, somebody else can reuse or upcycle. So they, as students, are making those decisions. Our students are using vintage a lot. They're not going for the fast fashion. They're going for pre-loved fashion. But that way they are selling their own clothes. They're making money to be able to buy new clothes. So they've got personal benefit from it too. But they're recognising the importance of those little things that they are doing to improve things. The other thing I think we really need to think about is how is it impacting on them? So they, a lot of them can see climate change and environmental change as something that is not in their lifetime. They can't see it happen. So we, we have a unit where we do look at climate change, but they look at local area to us. They look at Thorpe Bay and Jaywick and the impacts of rising sea levels on Thorpe Bay and Jaywick. And they study um, the plans for the coastline and to see the management plans and they look at well this is once what's going to happen if sea levels rise so looking at it locally they then do look at it globally and we have a unit of looking at it linked to rights and linked to indigenous populations of other countries and different people so we look at it in terms of lgbtq plus communities so where you've got climate change migrants for example how the vulnerable vulnerabilities of being LGBTQ plus in certain countries if you're a climate change migrant, looking at the kind of work people do in different countries to get them having that empathy for other people. So the little things that they do can impact on others. We've also got to think about where are they getting their information from? Yes, we're teaching them, but I know my own daughter who's aged a year eight age, TikTok is a big influence on their lives, as is YouTube. And there's a lot of misinformation out there. So we need to make sure that they're really thinking about what they're listening to. However, there's also a lot of good information going on. I've asked my students today, who's actually heard about the flooding in Bangladesh that's currently happening? A few of them put their hands up, but not all of them. Right, where have you heard about it? On TikTok. So they are seeing, and things like TikTok are giving them firsthand impressions of things that are happening around the world. People who are in those situations. Now they can't trust them all, obviously, but there are elements there which they are picking up on and then they may go and research more themselves. So we can't, while I hate it myself, we can't dismiss it as something that we just don't want them to engage with because they're going to engage. So how can we use that and how can we direct them to use it in a way that's going to influence their decision making? So just as a takeaway, I think we really need to use our students' voice. What do they want? How do they want to learn? Where are they getting their influences from and how can we help them influence decisions we make in school? Because those little decisions we make in school can then influence their life outside of school on a slow drip by drip basis. Uh, but we've really got to be careful about thinking about their backgrounds and not just demanding they make changes that are not realistic for them. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thanks so much, Ahina. Thanks to uh, Cyrus and Noel as well. Um, some really thought provoking uh, presentations there. Uh, and I think a, a common theme sort of running through those three presentations is around that idea that we need to listen to our students and, and find out what future uh, they want. So yeah, thanks so much. I don't know if people want to do a virtual uh, um, uh, uh, applause for those uh, presentations. Um, we have some time left for um, questions and answers. Um, so you can either um, put questions in the chat um, or you can unmute, put your camera on and uh, ask questions. So maybe put your hand up to indicate that you uh, uh, have a question uh, for one of the uh, presenters and maybe direct your question at particular people um, if you've uh, got someone in mind to answer it for you. Um, so that awkward silence, as I say, um, who'd like to ask a question? Uh, 
uh, David. Thank you. Uh, thanks. That was fantastic. Really, um, really thought provoking. Uh, great. And I think that the silence actually is people are probably a bit too sort of, uh, I, you know, I don't want to jump in um, before others. But anyway, I put my hand up. Um, my, my question I put in the chat, actually, um, uh, as I said, is there a contradiction um, in the implicit message sent to most young people by most schools um, of a competitive exam results to get ahead a bit of a dog eat dog world even schools which resemble something of a factory or a, a production line you could say um, you know the very nature of, of what it means certainly in England in most schools to go to school and um, go through school and then trying to send these messages um, and, and trying to, you know, uh, empower young people. Is that just too much of a contradiction that d does the whole nature of um, what it feels like to go to school need to change? Can I take that to start with? So I, I teach now from this since this year in a girls grammar school, which make you would think competitive results are really important and they can be but there's a couple of things here one we are living in a capitalist society so we have to understand that our students are going into that society so it's how can we influence them or direct them into thinking about how can they make that into a positive for climate so for example we've had people in to speak about jobs that they do that are linked with um thinking about environmental issues, but still working within capitalist societies. So just giving them those alternative things to think about. Um, but also we are trying to foster students that want to make change, whether that be with environmental issues, whether it be with um, anti-racism and diversity and inclusion, whatever it might be, we're giving those students that we teach, and it is boys in sixth form too, um, an opportunity to have a strong student voice and to think about their actions, as well as, yes, you need to get good exam results, but there is room for both. And you're right, a lot of schools don't do both. And there are schools out there that are very much the exam production line and students that we get coming to us in sixth form, you can see that in them. And you can see the difference in the schools that have sort of fostered that thinking about what they're gonna do that's gonna influence the world within the constraints that we've got. Because I think that's really important. We can't just expect them all to be um, Vanessa Nakatis, et cetera, who are going to go out and really change things or really make an influence, because that's not realistic. So we've got to sort of think realistically, but actually empower them to want to make those changes. Thank you. Do we have another question? Perhaps I'll just return to something actually in the chat that uh, John Morgan uh, put in. Um, it's quite interesting, uh, Hina, as you were speaking before you got to the point in your uh, presentation where you talked about we, then uh, um, John had put, uh, do we revert to the communal we too soon? Um, so I, I might go over to John to uh, um, say something about that. Yes, um, sorry, I'll start my video. Um, yeah, it was really because I, I was thinking that as we were going along, this sort of this failure sometimes in the, in the past in geography education to engage with politics and the Anthropocene. I think again can be seen it. Sorry, my dog's barking at me talking. Um, the the politic Anthropocene could could be used to create a universalism, which in no sense is a bad thing. Whereas Hina's talk began to unpick some of the the, the differences. I mean, I, I think there is, there's class too, as well as race, and those are in, intersected, and that, those have to be unpicked. And I think as a my, my question was, as a community, we haven't been good at doing that type of thinking aloud together, and this seminar is a good opportunity to do that. Um, but I but I think I wanted to sort of just say one more thing, really, which I think. Noel made a great point about the importance of the Anthropocene and, and its moment now. And its, its moment seems to be cultural as much as scientific. There are lots of discourses of the Anthropocene. 
And maybe for us as a community of geography teachers, it's the cultural moment of the Anthropocene, the representations, as Cyrus has talked a little bit about, the fictions, the, the histories, the way in which our, our different subjects, history, geography, English, science, talk about the Anthropocene in rather different ways. And that's the productive sphere that teachers can work in. So schools are always about, it seems to me, about the culture we produce. Um, so I wanted to sort of re-emphasize that cultural element. I'd be interested to know what, what talk, the speakers think around that. Sorry, a little bit confused with my dog and children going to school uh, to be coherent. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not. I'm sorry, I'm not. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure I have anything sort of profound to say about that. But I think I think you're right, uh, John. Yeah, I think um, it is John, right? Sorry, because your your name's Dream on the screen. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, I think I, I think the the Anthropocene is being um, kind of um, addressed in a range of different registers. Uh, I think that's that's and same with climate change. Obviously, that's what's quite exciting pedagogically because, um, and Sirius alluded to this when he talked about art. I think there there are there are a set of different ways in which you can legitimately get students to think about all sorts of different dimensions of the issue, from like, what's causing it, who's responsible, um, what different sorts of people in different places are able to do about it, um, what it means morally. Uh, what it means emotionally. Um, I teach, um, well, when I was in Manchester, I'm not there at the moment, but um, I teach a first year undergraduate um, module, normally has between 100 and 150 students per annum, and it's called the human planet. Um, well, one of the things that was huge fun for me and, uh, and Martin Evans, a uh, physical geographer who co-taught it with me, uh, who some of you will know, um, is that we were able to do get all sorts of things into the lecture theatre from you know the actual science stuff, getting students to read the science, think about the science, little podcasts from the scientists, including a colleague of ours called Kevin Anderson, who's quite an outspoken climate scientist. Um, yeah, through to getting them to read excerpts of things like The Road by Cormac McCarthy, uh, to look at documentaries, to look at Hollywood movies. So. I think I think you can really speak to students in the, the sort of full spectrum of their humanity around these issues, intellectually, emotionally, morally. And that's, for me, what makes it such a teachable thing. It's really exciting, as long as you can bring it down to earth for students and they don't feel overwhelmed, which is the point I was making earlier. Thanks, Noel. I don't know if uh, Cyrus or... Uh... You know, want to uh, add any comment to that? Otherwise, I'll move on to uh, a comment to the chat. Uh, I'll just jump in briefly. So that the question um, reminds me a lot of Catherine Yusuf's work and and her book on uh, Billy and Black Anthropocene. I think, yeah, um, uh, that work which came out a few years ago. Um, I, I think it's a really important question and really um, really important work. I, I just think I'm, I'm going to keep thinking about it and sitting with that that challenge um, and. and yeah, but thank you for raising it. Thanks. Um, so going over to uh, a comment made by uh, David Alcock, and he might want to uh, um, ask his question, but um, he just said that great thought-provoking uh, discussions and great point uh, from David Mitchell too um, with regard to the purpose of education. I don't know, David, if you want to uh, ask your question. Um, Perhaps I'll just yeah. share it. Yeah. Um, okay, great. Yeah, I, I've I've been doing some work with different departments at, at school on the idea of hopeful education, but it, it it we it's it's hard. I find it hard to approach the idea of whether it's sustainability or the broader question of the Anthropocene without coming across as being um, a, a sort of proselytizing or something, or without coming across as being the teacher who sort of interferes in, in other subjects, but but it, it's such an important issue for other subjects. And there is the, the idea that Dave Mitchell brought up um, or has in the past about uh, exams being the focus of, of schools. How do we engage teachers outside of geography 
let alone some other geography teachers, into this idea of the Anthropocene? How, how do we engage them without um, uh, falling victim to, to various um, challenges of that? Um, because you can't, it's too big a thing, it's too complex, it's too wicked a, a thing to, uh, to, to take on as geography teachers alone. And, it's, it, but, and yet it's, it's really important for the whole school system to engage with it. So I wonder how, how we can go about doing that. I think there's more being taught than you might think in inadvertent ways. So, for example, English and languages um, use environmental issues to teach certain elements of, so you know, writing styles and um, within languages. Maybe not so much Key Stage Three, but you know, at GCSE and A level, they have units where they are talking about impacts on environment. Um, I think the students don't always um, see it because it's not explicit. But there is more going on than you might think. And I think it is sort of putting it together to make it more explicit as to what's happening where. Because obviously science do touch on it. Um, here, like my students said, or history do, because they talk about it with Industrial Revolution. So again, it's maybe for me, and I'm doing it through diversity as well and teaching about different cultures. It's sort of going to subjects and saying that you're probably already doing this. Can we have a look at your curriculum and see where you're doing it? And you'll find that actually they pick things out much more easily than you might think that they haven't just haven't made explicit. And then it's a case of, right, can we now make this explicit that this actually links to? And I found those conversations and actually with my school, the students go and have those conversations and they work with the teachers to go, right, can we just look at this within computer science, wherever it might be? And they work on it together. Um, and that for me works really, really well. And again, it's that empowerment of, of getting the students to go and, I say make people feel guilty but they have been doing that as well um they've just been talking about use of paper and they're like well the person who uses the most paper is the head teacher so we're going to have to go and speak to them about sorting that out a little bit aren't we and they will um and it is it's getting that empowerment to make sort of make those little changes but also to make teachers in other subjects realize it's not a bigger deal as they might think it is because then they're more likely to do it that's what i found works anyway so do you want to add to that it's a great question. I think um, one of the things that came to my mind was how long will it be until the materiality of climate change and the problems force us and cause us to, to, to have to rethink how we teach? Um, and also thinking about the privileged position from which many of us teach in and the environments we teach in. I wonder whether the answer would be different in different parts of the world where you know, um, natural hazards and disasters uh, are, and the effects of climate change are felt acutely every single, you know, uh, you know, moment. And, um, yeah, you know, thinking about, about the materiality of the, those consequences. Steve. Hi, thanks very much. Sorry, my uh, I can't really turn my camera on in a minute. Um, sorry. Um, so thanks so much. I, it's just been brilliant to listen to you. There's so many uh, amazing um, thoughts and provocations that it's made me think of. But one particular thing that I was keen to pick up on was um, some of the things that that Noel you were saying about uncertainty, um, and and obviously this notion of uncertainty cuts through um, so many of these issues. Um, and that kind of quick example from say IPCC reports and and the amount of times that either we get this notion of uncertainty um, or of kind of confidence. Um, and for teachers, it seems to create this kind of massive challenge because the, the nature of the knowledge is, is often so technical. I mean, you brought up so many kind of other ways in which um, kind of knowledge is, is being pushed forward. And I have kind of not quite an idea of like quite how rapid the growth has been in um, kind of scientific attention to some of these issues. Um, some of the kind of like geotechnical solutions and so on just means that there's a huge kind of um, gap, I guess, between knowledge that teachers have got, the kinds of certainty with which some of these things are being kind of framed in terms of the solutions uh, and the need for that. Um, so sorry, it's like a long waffling question, but I guess my, kind of, my, my question is, what are your thoughts about this particular idea, uncertainty? What's your kind of advice to teachers? Like how should they navigate this idea of uncertainty. Hi, Steve. Uh, yeah, nice to hear your voice. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's a good question. Uh, I guess there, you've, you've touched upon two things. So one is 
I guess it's to do with teachers' knowledge and, and uncertainty about what actually you know they should know. Um, and I guess I don't really, I don't have any particularly good advice on on that one. I think in respect of the Anthropocene debate specifically, as opposed to climate change, which is a linked but sort of quasi autonomous topic. Um, it, it, oh, the literature is so big. So, um, you know, what I tried to do in my last slide um, is just identify, you know, some basic resources that are accessible, that are reasonably good quality. Um, but as I said at the start of my talk, even for myself, you know, I'm, I'm sort of paid to spend time looking at this stuff and I struggle to keep up uh, with the science and the non-science literature. So it's really tricky. But the other, the other part of uncertainty, um, which, you know, I think it is important for students to really consider is, you know, what at the end of the day, can we not know, um, regardless of how sophisticated our theories are, our data gathering techniques, the satellite systems we have observing the earth and so on and so forth. Um, what, what can we not know, given the complexities of the earth's total environment, and given the fact that it's, you know, it's not a machine, it's an evolutionary thing. Um, there, there are all sorts of different trajectories that it can um, kind of go along over time. So um, that's true of climate change. It's true of the Anthropocene more broadly. Um, and I guess the really the key teachable thing for students is, for me anyway, is just to get them to think about the difference between closed systems and open systems. That if you can't control open systems and you don't quite know what they're going to do, uh, and in the present case, the Anthropocene, you, you know that some of the impacts of that, those system changes are going to be extremely negative for various people. You don't quite know where and how, but you know it's going to happen. It's going to be negative in many cases. So, you know, what ought we to be doing today to um, ensure that the worst consequences don't come to pass? And, um, you know, it, it, again, it's, it's a potentially overwhelming question, uh, but it's a real question. It's, mean, it's a meaningful question. So I think if there's a way to make that concrete, um, you know, to get students to think about particular places and how they might look in 100 years or 150 years, sea level rise is a very teachable thing, um, although it's going to happen quite slowly, um, we think. Um, so I think, yes, yeah, so, so I think in terms of teaching, the, the uncertainty thing is a really important topic for students to get their heads around, because I think a lot of students are encouraged to believe that things can be controlled. Um, because in our everyday lives, you know, things are fairly small scale and manageable. Well, this is not one of those issues. It's, it's, it's a tricky one. Brilliant. Thanks very much. That's really helpful. Thanks, Steve. Um, just on that note, actually, um, something that uh, uh, Sirius, you talked about, uh, sort of environmental activism and the school as a site of uh, environmental activism. Um, I, I wondered uh, if you wanted to uh, sort of where, where can we take that? You know, how can we change it so that, uh, you know, schools are, are recognised as that site of environmental activism and actually uh, around sort of students, I suppose, uh, and their identity as environmental activists, even though they might not consider themselves to be activists if they're not stood somewhere with a placard, you know, shouting at people. Schools are, are you know, are quite difficult places for researchers to enter as sites of, of, of research you know, for ethical reasons and, and other reasons. And I wonder whether there is, you know, there's room for, you know, more research in schools, more attention to what goes on in schools. And I also wonder whether there's, 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 there's a greater attention to the barriers through which, which prevent teachers and people from, you know, engaging in these environmental actions. I think one of them was raised earlier around examination and just linking to the, to the point that, that was just made around uncertainty. Well, I wonder whether, you know, the examinations and, and the kinds of knowledge we need to teach promote a kind of certainty about the world rather than this kind of more humble, perhaps uncertain um, kind of a way of thinking around the world. And I wonder whether that, that in itself becomes a barrier to environmental action. That's a great point. And actually, uh, the value there, just thinking of, uh, of uh, Hina and bringing in sort of uh, um, pupils voice to a lot of the things that you do in school, um, that it's actually important to understand that we've got knowledges around uh, uh, what we do. And uh, it, it's, it's such a sort of attention, isn't it, in, in the world in which we work in schools that we have, you know, there's exams that do sort of drive so many of the decisions. And as you say, uh, uh, Sirius, how 
students view knowledge, you know, singular as, as the thing that they need to learn in order to pass those uh, uh, exams. Uh, Hina, I don't know if you want to add anything uh, about uh, schools as sites as environmental activists. I think part of the problem with it is keeping the momentum going. So you can have a few students that are sort of really into it, they get the programme going and then they leave. And then, you know, it's it's keeping it up. And I think as, as teachers, we have to sort of help facilitate that transition from year group to the next or making it cross phases um, because it's doable. But you need an SLT that are willing to listen to students and take on board what what they want in terms of activism. Um, so, again, it's not just the the placards and protests it's actual change um, and if they don't have you know if we can't give them the support and show them that they're suggesting something let's do it or well that might not work but let's try this as a version of it then they're going to be put off so it's really up to schools because it, it doesn't have you know it be yes there's constraints of exams but it doesn't have to be in class time um, we do a lot of it through tutor time, um, but we have clubs as well. We've got a club called Planet Action, which was doing really well. And it's sort of, there's not as much attendance this term. So the teacher in charge, she's all right, I've got this plan to get it regenerated next term. We'll start again from scratch. And it is having that momentum going. But my SLT are very open to suggestions from students. And I can honestly say my last SLT at my previous school weren't necessarily. And that shows such a difference. And I think schools can do more because we're we're shaping people that are going into society and they've got to believe they can make changes. And if it's small scale changes at school, well, that's a good starting point. So, you know, if people can, you know, we can go away and sort of make that happen. I think that's really important. And, you know, I'm, I feel I'm in a school with activism going on, um, but I know lots of schools where it doesn't. And it is it is the influence of what they can do and how much SLT will let them do that really makes a difference. That's great. Thanks, uh, Hina. Um, I'll just go back to um, David Mitchell, if that's OK, David. Um, he's uh, just uh, putting uh, some comments in the chat, so it's probably far easy just to uh, uh, share them uh, with everyone. Yeah, and it, it's great. I was just thinking, Hina, it's great to, to hear what you're saying and, and what you're doing in school, you know, with um, the, the openness of the senior management to, to really, you know, uh, looking at the, I think, the messages that, that are that a sense that that children pick up about um, uh, what what school is all about, um, and yeah, I, I guess hope for the future. Um, so yeah, th this project that, that I've mentioned is just a small uh, project, um, but sustainability across subjects. We called it. I know the word sustainability perhaps isn't you know these these days quite the right word, but um, but anyway, um, from from a geography. Uh, origin um, we, we thought and it, it crossed my mind that um, geography uh, is is not enough um, uh, alone and it came out of the the capabilities um, uh, project you many of you know about the geographic capabilities idea geo capabilities and and broadening that to include uh, other subjects and from some conversations I had with uh, colleagues in history and RE as well, for example, you know, looking at the um, the values dimension, the ethical dimension, and the point that you know you can't understand uh, climate change, Anthropocene, without a historical perspective, um, and there are you know deep, deep ethical and and values uh, questions um, and around different um, groups of people and social justice, and actually, yeah, when, when you the, the project is about getting teachers talking to each other. Um, Initially, student teachers uh, or student teachers has been the focus on the PGCE, um, and it's it's looking very promising. I mean, we've just been doing this project for uh, this year, um, but uh, when you have small groups of teachers talking together, it does seem to um, have opened up some really productive conversations. So, geographers listening to English teachers, and as John's put in the uh, the, the chat there, because John was contributing to um, the event we had for all of the different subjects on the PGC at the Institute. Um, yeah, uh, design, art and design. We've heard about art uh, today, of course, music. Um, uh, so things that you don't, it's kind of surprising, modern foreign languages, um, but uh, 
I was a little bit inspired from Mark Maslin, who um, we, we managed to, to give some input at the start of the, of the project um, and using his TED talk, using the phrase, um, have that conversation, you know, get the conversation, just start a conversation and things can lead from there. Um, so that's the, the gist of the, of, of the project. Um, but I, I agree, I think um, subjects alone in isolation, geography alone, and that's my point about the, the big message that can be taken in school, you know, um, that I made earlier. Um, it's very difficult, I think, to, to sort of change um, hearts and minds, if you like, um, within sort of subject silos in this big system where maybe the, the main message, not maybe in all schools and rights respecting schools, as Hino has said, is, is a good way forward. Um, but um, yeah, I, I must stop talking because it's, uh, it's nine o'clock. But uh, thank you for Emma for um, asking. Thanks so much, uh, David. Uh, it sounds like a really interesting uh, project and, and good luck with that uh, as it uh, goes forward. Um, so, yeah, it is nine o'clock. Uh, I don't want to hold people uh, too late uh, in, in the evening. So I think we will wrap it up now. Uh, and it just falls to me to say thanks so much. It's uh, greatly appreciated uh, that uh, we've had three wonderful uh, presentations uh, today. So thanks so much uh, to Noel, uh, to Sirius, to uh, Hina. Um, so, yeah, round of applause or virtual round of applause from everyone uh, um, thanks and I have the rest of a, a good day, uh, Noel and the rest of us, uh, it's nearly the end of, uh, oh sorry, and John, uh, for the rest of us, uh, uh, have a good evening and uh, um, yeah, goodbye. <laughs>